In this tutorial, we're going to be introduced to some core physics concepts while we try to build a trampoline with a bit of creative thinking. I'm sure you've seen a trampoline. It's a piece of flexible material attached to many springs that are connected to some kind of frame. So how can we build it? We have ropes in CryEngine, but they're not elastic. A rigid platform is easy enough. A stretchable, deformable soft surface is a bit more complicated. So I'm going to address that in a follow-up tutorial and just work with a rigid platform in this particular one. If you look through the components here, you're not going to find a spring. If you're a programmer, you could make one easily enough, as the formula for a spring is pretty simple, although there's still the issue of attaching it to other entities. So here's where you need to think a little outside the box as you look through these existing components. Can you think of anything that uses springs? Well, it turns out that vehicles need suspension in order to absorb bumps. In other words, they have springs. And our wheel collider component is where you'll find springs hiding. And although a vehicle that's suspended on top of springs and wheels is somewhat different than a trampoline platform suspended from springs, we're going to try and push this tech today and see what these components can do for us if we treat them sort of unconventionally. So let's build it. First, we need the vehicle physics component. So I'm just going to create an empty entity. You can also just start with a component, and then I'm going to go click on Add Component. And the first thing that I need is the vehicle physics. The wheel collider component that actually has the spring isn't going to work unless we also have a vehicle physics component. The controls you see here all have to do with driving, speed, changing gears, etc., which we obviously don't need. So we're just going to collapse that. Next, we're going to add a wheel collider, which again is under the physics group. And I'm going to come in and take a closer look at my wheel collider. And if you look closely in here, you will see the spring sort of hiding in here. First thing I'm going to do, though it really makes no difference, is just make the wheel a bit bigger so it's easier for us to see. I'm going to make it 2 meters in diameter and 1 meter wide. The vehicle physics component physicalizes your entity as a rigid body derived wheel vehicle. In other words, a rigid body that has a suspension system and gears that are normally used to drive the vehicle. Our trampoline obviously doesn't need to drive, so we can ignore these gear settings and collapse these vehicle physics properties. But we still need the vehicle physics component in order for the wheel colliders to work. I'm going to increase the mass a bit. These are all properties that are going to affect the bounce here. And the next thing I'm going to do is add a mesh so that our trampoline has a surface that the player can collide with, and the whole entity isn't invisible. As you'll see if I turn the helpers off, there's nothing to see there. So again, add component. This is all obviously using entity components. And under geometry, you'll find mesh. And instead of a sphere, we're going to need a platform that's fairly large and thin. Again, I'm not dealing with flexibility. I'm just going to use a rigid platform. Now, you could use the primitives here. You could come in here and select the box like this. But obviously, we want it to be a lot bigger than this. If we made it very thin, something like this, I don't know, 30 by 20 meters, that's all well and good, but the problem is as soon as we turn on physics, that scaling is going to be overridden. So we can't work with that. So you're actually going to have to create some kind of a model for the surface of the trampoline. I've used the designer tool to create a long, thin model. All I did was start with a box, make a nice big one, and make it very thin. I gave it a material, and then went to the transform tab and exported it as a CGF. So now what I'm going to do is just select that model that I exported as our mesh geometry. And I have it under Objects, Trampoline. I've created a few versions of this. I'm going to use this one right here. And I need to go back to my normal scaling. And there it is. And you can see, because in my case, I'm using a 2 meter diameter wheel, it makes sense that I offset the position of the platform upward on the z-axis through this translation parameter right here. And since it's 2 meters high, anything around 2 meters or slightly more is fine. Let's go ahead and assign a material to it, just for fun. I've got kind of a, a rubbery material here that I'm going to use. I'm going to go ahead and give my entity a sensible name, trampoline. And now we need something heavy to drop onto this. So again, I'm going to go create something from scratch, an empty entity kind of floating around on top of this. I'm going to name this ball. You could name it player. Again, I'm going to add a mesh. And I'm just going to take the default sphere right there. Just going to end up moving it up into the air a bit. I'm going to give it a density that's quite heavy, 400. And I'm also going to scale it up, in my case, to twice its usual size. And again, if you want to pick some kind of material, just don't make the mistake of picking material for the entire entity. You want to pick a material just for the geometric mesh. I want to center my ball directly over my trampoline. So here's a little trick that you can do. I'm going to select the trampoline. 
and I'm going to go up to the transform properties here. I'm going to right click on position with my mouse and say copy all. That's going to copy all three values, my X, Y, and Z values. And I'm going to come to the ball and I'm going to paste it by right clicking on position here and say paste all. And now these two entities are in exactly the same position and I'm just going to offset it up 100 meters into the air, whatever I just need it to drop and fall under the trampoline. So I'll say 135 meters. And now if I kind of come back and take a look, there's what I've got so far, a ball hiding up in the air and my trampoline. I'm going to come in and take a closer look at our ball. And I'm going to reveal the hidden proxies by clicking on this button here, which is draw helpers. And you'll see that there is no proxy on the ball yet, as opposed to the trampoline down here and this vegetation that I have. So we need to add a rigid body component. I'm going to click on add component one more time. And again, under physics, we're going to find rigid body. And now we have our proxy mesh. One thing that does confuse some people is that CryEngine shows density both on the mesh and also on the rigid body. But in this case, we're going to set it on the mesh. I'm going to hide the proxies. I'm going to save my level. And let's just see what happens when we go ahead and drop our ball onto the trampoline. I'm going to go ahead and keep the helpers on and select the trampoline so we can see what happens. And what I'm going to do is just enable physics because I don't have a camera set up, so I'm not going to go into game. I'm just going to enable physics AI, which is this button, or you can use control P. The ball is going to fall and eventually strike the trampoline. And I think you'll be pretty impressed and satisfied that we've achieved our end goal. No, I'm kidding. Looks terrible. Doesn't look anything like a trampoline. And I bring this up because in a lot of cases, this is where most people bail. They don't get the result they're looking for quickly enough. They get frustrated and they think, well, it's just not possible. And I think the longer you're in game development, you're going to find that it just takes a lot of iteration and experimentation with these values in order to get things to work exactly the way you want them to. And this is no exception. So let's start looking at these properties in depth. First thing I'm going to do is, I know I'm going to be testing this a zillion times. As I said, we're going to iterate a lot. So I'm actually going to move the ball a lot closer to the ground, way down here. And I'm just going to push it down so that I don't have to wait for it to fall and accelerate through gravity. And I'm going to do that through a flow graph script. So I'm just going to right click on it and say create flow graph. Just going to call this ball. I've got my flow graph window open down here. You'll remember that you'll need to right click on here and reload graph list after you've added a new flow graph if you already have your flow graph editor open. On game start, I just want to push the ball down through physics using an action impulse. I'm going to assign the graph entity, which is the ball. That's the entity that houses the actual graph. On game start, I'm going to activate this, and the impulse that I want is negative on the z axis. I don't know exactly how much. Let's try something big. And if we enable our physics, not very impressive. Let's try something a lot bigger. Just add a zero and see what happens. And that's a pretty dramatic push. Maybe a little bit too dramatic because the thing is that the speed with which the ball hits the trampoline is really going to affect our perception of its needed bounciness. So I don't want to depart too wildly from the speed that the ball is going to achieve just through gravity. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. I've saved that. I'm just going to hide my flow graph window. And that'll just save me time. Time is money. Every time I enable physics or go into game to test this, I don't want to wait three seconds for this thing to fall 100 meters. So let's take a look at our trampoline entity. First thing I see is that wheel is poking up a little bit, so I'm going to offset that mesh just so it sort of clears the wheel. And if we come in and look very closely at this thing, you're going to see, now that I've adjusted the size of the wheel collider, that with the default values, my spring is actually incredibly tiny. It is actually that little tiny yellow line right there. And there are two values that are going to affect this, and that's suspension length and the initial or compressed suspension length. And the whole secret to getting this trampoline to work properly is to tweak these two values. I'm going to try a much longer length of two meters, and I'm going to try an initial compressed length of half that much. And now you really start to see the shape and length of the spring. The other thing is, I don't want damping. I don't want to stop or inhibit the movement. Once it starts moving, I really want it to be bouncy. There's also a parameter called ray casting, and if I enable that, that's going to make our wheel collider behave in more predictable ways, which will be a little bit more manageable. If you look in the documentation, or you can probably guess that driving isn't going to be a concern for us, and you'd probably want to leave handbrake on, though the truth is this does not break this from moving, it doesn't stop it from moving, it just enables the entity to receive a signal to break through a signal graph and schematic or through code. So just having changed those, turning off damping 
and changing this compression length and initial length. Now let's see what happens when we turn on physics with control P. Still not what we're looking for. And this is where the patience in the iteration comes in. So long story short on here, the difference between these two values makes all the difference in the world. We're going to have an exponential response as we start to tweak this. So I'm going to increase these numbers so that I can get a very small percentage of difference between the two values, literally a millimeter in length. And I'm going to move this platform up like this so it's above the spring. I'm going to save my level, and I'm going to again hit Control-P and let the ball drop. And now we start to get some serious bouncing. The next thing that we want to look at are some of these other properties. I'm going to change the mass of the mesh to be considerably heavier. Let's try 50 kilograms and enable physics. And now we start to get a heck of a bounce. In fact, it's so springy right now that the ball is bouncing higher on the bounce than its origin point. But remember that we're using an action impulse, not just gravity in this case. And remember that the closer these two values are, the stronger the spring is, which means the more it's able to resist compression from the weight of the player striking the surface, and that'll give us more rebound. So if it's too strong, we can always separate these two values by a little bit more. So we're getting pretty good bounce here, but you can see right away that the next problem that we have is this whole entity starts to bounce out of control, to twist, to rotate, and do weird things. You might think that the trampoline is unstable because it's balanced only on one wheel, but if you experiment and add three more wheel colliders and spread them around under this mesh, you'll see exactly the same behavior. It may just fall in slightly different directions, but it's still not going to stabilize our mesh platform. So if you think about this, all we want this platform to do is to go straight up and straight down. We don't want it to slide on the X or Y axes, only on Z. And the easiest way to manage that is to add a component called a constraint. Physics constraint. And in this case, we're just going to add what's called a line constraint, because we literally only want to move it up or down on one axis. And that's going to be Z right here. Now initially, with the default values, we're not going to get any movement at all. We haven't given it a minimum, which means it can't move down initially. So what I'm going to do is let it move down as far as the entire height of this thing above the ground. And I actually think I have it a bit too high floating above the ground. Here we go. Let's see how that looks. And if you look closely here, this thick yellow line appears when I start to increase these values. So from the pivot of the entity, which is the center of the wheel itself, I have the ability to move down in a distance of two. So let's see how that looks. I'm getting pretty good motion going down, and you notice that the platform is stabilized. It's not sliding to the left or to the right, or back and forth. It can only move up or down. But it looks a little bit unrealistic because it can't travel past the origin point. And that's because my maximum limit of setting here. If my maximum limit is set to zero, that means my entity won't be able to travel upwards past the origin point. If I do too much, this thing is really going to bounce up and down. And I just need to experiment with the values until I'm happy with it. The other thing that you'll notice about line constraints is they have their own damping. And that's actually going to work better than damping on the suspension here. So we can start to experiment with this. I'll try a setting of two, and you'll see a difference with the whole entity quiets down very quickly. And again, this is just a matter of experimentation until you're happy with the way that it settles. It's never going to look exactly like a trampoline because we don't have horizontal springs that are stretching in the same way. But the point is, can we get it close enough, given the components that we have, without having to write code? The other thing to consider is that we might want to add a constraint to the ball. If we want to make a side scroller, for instance, so that the player bounces in and goes from spot to spot or trampoline to trampoline, and we don't want any movement on this axis, we can add a plane constraint to the ball, which limits movement to two axes at maximum. So I've selected my ball entity. I'm going to add component. I'm going to go back to physics constraints and add a plane constraint. And as long as you have your helpers on here, You'll see this entity, and you'll see the way that it's constrained by default is only to move horizontally, but not vertically. Obviously, that's not what we want, so we're going to come down here. And these work on a scale from 0 to 1. So what I want to do is allow it to move on Z. And there seems to be some sort of rotation. It's thinking of the entity as rotated, even though I haven't rotated it. So I'm just going to trust the helper here, the yellow helper, in terms of positioning this by I. And it turns out to be X in this case. So that should allow us to guarantee that the ball can only move straight up and down and this way, which is the Y axis in my game. Something that you may be disconcerted by if you start working with constraints is if you want to constrain along two axes, 
and you go to type a one, which is the maximum value in the second box, you're going to see that the values are automatically adjusted because it's calculating a direction. Take a look at the vector here and you can see how this is working. You can also drag these and adjust them while watching this constraint helper visually. If I want to get something back to one, I need to set the other two to zero first, and now I'm back to where I want it to be. Now that I kind of have things working pretty much the way I want them, I want to return the ball to its original movement using gravity instead of an action impulse. So I'm going to come back to my flow graph and actually get rid of this action impulse, and I'm going to move this back to where it was, somewhere around 134, wherever you want to position it, and then just go ahead and watch it drop and see what kind of bounce that I'm getting. Once I've got this and I see what kind of acceleration I've got going, I can adjust my spring length and my compressed spring length, the mass of the ball and the mass of the mesh on the trampoline, as well as the line constraint until I get the behavior that I want out of my trampoline. So that's it for the physics part of this tutorial. All we did was experiment with some components and push the values to behave somewhat differently than they would normally be used. The next section of this tutorial, I'm gonna work on setting up a third person camera it's not going to be dealing with physics, but if you're new to setting up cameras and scripting them in Flowgraph, you can continue on with this tutorial. Okay, in order to set up a camera, there's any number of ways to do this. You could build a side-scroller camera. I'm going to build a camera that sort of follows the ball in the foreground and looks down from above it. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to into full screen view, and I'm going to try and sort of set up my initial camera view that I'm looking for. Something like that. And I just kind of want to have this dramatic view of sort of the ball's point of view, but also keeping the ball in the frame. So what I'm going to do once I have it roughly in position with the default sandbox camera is go to the perspective viewports camera menu and say create camera from current view. I get a new entity here just with the default name. I'm going to rename it camera underscore player. And if I zoom back a little and have it selected, I can actually see its field of view. If you want to see what it sees, you can switch from the default camera to that camera entity, which now appears in this menu. And there we go. Just to position it exactly, I'm going to link the camera to the ball temporarily so I can see its position relative to the ball. And this will make it very easy for me to get it exactly centered behind the ball. And in this case, I'm going to move it back five meters and five meters above it. So it's very close to the foreground. In a 16 by 9 full screen view, this is what my view looks like. Maybe I'll adjust that slightly. I'm also going to switch to a 16 by 9 view so I can see an exact view of the camera. I'm going to move a bit more above the ball, 6 meters, and still 5 meters behind it on the Y axis. And there we go. I'm going to switch back to my default camera. So what I want to happen is as this ball moves, the camera moves with it. And in fact, if I turn on physics right now, because I have the camera linked to the ball, this is absolutely the most simple way to move a camera. You'll see the ball accelerate downward, and the camera's linked to it, and it's just going to keep falling with it. I'm going to keep that camera selected so that you can see this. Put it in full screen view. I want to pull back and see this whole view, and you'll notice that my camera is disappearing. The camera is an invisible entity, so the only reason I'm seeing it is because I have helpers enabled. However, if I get too far away, the helpers automatically hide themselves. If you're not familiar with how to adjust that setting, it's under Edit, Preferences. And if you come down to Viewport, General, you'll see the setting that says Display Helpers Up to Given Distance. So if you're having a problem like I am, where the helpers are disappearing when you're far away and need to see things, just increase this value. And now you'll see that I'm able to see the helpers even when I'm 200 meters away. So here I am in full screen view, and I can pull back and just watch how this is going to work. Camera is always going to stay at the same angle. There's nothing rotating. It's literally just slave to the ball's position. If we go ahead and look at it from the camera's perspective, this is what it looks like in game. And there's nothing wrong with this necessarily, but it's sort of very mechanical and rigid. It doesn't have a very smooth feeling. So what I want to do is make the camera feel a bit more organic with a little bit of flow graph. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my physics, go back to my default camera like this. I'm going to go back to the flow graph script that I had started. Remember that this is attached to the ball, not to the camera. And I know what I'm going to need to do is move my camera entity. So I'm going to start with an entity called Movement, Move Entity 2. I've got the camera selected, so I'm going to right click and assign the selected entity. So I'm moving the camera. I've got to tell it where to move it. And you also want to think in terms of the other W questions, when to start moving, where to move to, etc. 
So the position where the camera should go is an offset from the ball's current position. So that means I need to know the ball's position on every frame of the game. The easiest way to do that is an, a node called Entity Position, which is under the Entity group. I'm going to go ahead and assign the graph entity because this is attached to the ball already. Just be careful that you don't do this because then the camera will be moved exactly to where the ball is. It'll literally be on top of it and you won't see the ball at all. So instead of doing that, I need to build in my offset. And that's going to be a VEC3 node. I can add or subtract. I can even multiply. I'm just going to use add. So I'm going to take the existing position of the ball. And if you remember that offset, I'm going to subtract 5 meters on the y-axis and add 6 meters on the z-axis. That's going to be my target position, so I'll feed it to the destination. And I'm also going to use that signal to actually start the movement. And here's a critical concept. Remember that entity position queries every single frame of the game. The way that you can tell in full graph is there's no trigger or start input. That means it's always listening, it's always updating its value every frame of the game. You wouldn't want to use that unless you need to because it's asking the computer to do a lot of work. So if it's a question you only need to ask occasionally, find yourself something like get position in this case, which actually has a manual input. So in the few occasions where you need this information, you can actually trigger this get and then get a one-time position. We need to know constantly because the ball is always going to be moving. So this gets it started in the camera group. We need a node called camera view because in game start, we actually have to enable this camera. We actually have to switch to it. I need to go back, select my camera. I also need to remember to unlink the camera from the ball. I don't want it slave to it. I'm going to assign it to this camera view entity. So when the game starts, we go ahead and enable that camera. And then the other common mistake with move entity two is to forget to assign either a speed or how long it should take to move to that position. Well, you might think we just want to keep this at zero and set it to time. And if we go into game and full screen, it's pretty much exactly the same as the camera was linked to the ball. It's exactly the same effect. So to make it feel organic, the trick is actually just to build in a little bit of lag time, a little bit of a delay. I'm going to try four tenths of a second. So that means that the camera's movement is always going to lag four tenths of a second behind the ball. So you see in the beginning, the ball accelerates away from the camera. And then as the ball jumps up quickly, the ball exits the frame, the field of view of the camera somewhat, which is actually a problem that we need to solve. So I like this flowy feeling where the camera is sort of more gently moving. It's not jerking with rapid movements of the ball. But I have to solve the problem of the player or the ball disappearing from the field of view of the camera. And for that, I'm going to use a very handy node under the entity group called Entity Face Hat. Again, I want to make sure I have my camera selected. I'm going to tell it it's the camera that I want to rotate, which is effectively what Entity Face Hat does. And I need to give it a target or a position. I'm already tracking the position of the player, which is the ball. So I could use that here, like this. And then on Game Start, I just need to activate this thing. But I'm going to have troubles with the ball spinning and also spinning the camera. So instead of using this VEC3 value, I'm going to just use Entity ID. And I'm going to get the graph entity, which is actually the ball in this case. And I'm going to feed that as the target. The other trick to using Entity Face Hat is this thing called forward direction. Which way am I facing? And in this case, that's going to be forward on the Y axis. The orientation is going to be different depending on which way you built your game. But the way to figure this out is to simply go in here, select your entity, turn on physics, and you can see what's happening is that it's actually spinning and facing the wrong way. And you can keep doing this while changing this forward direction value until you get the kind of turn that you're looking for. And in my case, it's Y plus because I'm moving sort of side scroller style positive on the Y axis this way. So now if I save and go into game, this is what it looks like. Even when the ball jumps up, the camera quickly rotates and keeps facing the ball. It's also useful to look at this with physics enabled like this. I'm just going to watch the camera entity rotate. I can actually see it moving. So enable physics rather than going into game, and you'll see the camera rotating and following the ball really nicely. And you get this very smooth kind of movement. And remember that the distance between the ball and the camera is just that add vec 3 offset. By the way, if you see that jerky camera movement at the beginning of the game, it's because the initial camera's position relative to the ball is not the same as the offset value that I've chosen here, which is minus 5 and 6 on Y and Z. So I can go ahead and link the camera back to the ball temporarily and make sure that those values are correct. 
and also that there is no unwanted rotation, which I actually have in there. The other thing that can cause that is that this rotation is not quite the same as what the entity face hat is coming up with. So you can continue testing here. You can see in, in my case, it's rotated a bit too much this way. So I can adjust my rotation around the x-axis until there's less of a jerk. And it's more aligned with what the entity face hat wants to do. So if you want to keep going with this, obviously you can adjust the strength of this springiness. And you could make more of these trampolines and copy them and paste them and bounce from one to the other. If I want to start to make this more of a game, I could take this ball and move it back a bit and apply an action impulse to push it forward along the y-axis, in my case, on game start. If I wanted to move faster, I could also add a downward impulse on the z-axis. And there's our finished flow graph script. And that's it for this tutorial.